Right, so lecture number three is on uh, classification of computer systems. It's a fairly short, it's a fairly short, uh, it's a fairly short lecture series. We just want to gain an appreciation of the, the various types of computer systems that are available out there, right? So that when we start zeroing in into our discussion of, of uh, the high level components of, of, of this, this thing that we are calling uh, a computer system, and basically our emphasis is going to be on the Voinomian architecture, would, would have had an idea of the sort of functionalities or the functional attributes exhibited by the, the various types of computer systems, right? Right, so just a quick rundown of some, some announcements. Uh, we've moved the Tuesday slot to Friday 7 to 8, L-R-I-E. Um, your UNSA assigned email addresses have been created for you, right? Um, so you'll be, you'll be showing exactly how to use these things, uh, hopefully during the Moodle training, but ideally your, your UNSA assigned email address is your computer number at student.unza.zm, right? Um, the reason this is important is because uh, there is a course mailing list and you can only access the course mailing list using your UNSA assigned email address, right? Uh, Moodle training, like I said, is scheduled for Wednesday at 12 hours. Please show up a few minutes before. It's going to be in the library basement computer laboratory, right? Uh, arrangements are still being made with regards to tutorial sessions. These are likely going to uh, start next week. And then we have our first quiz on Friday, right? Right, so just uh, we've moved this from Tuesday to here. We've, we've moved that from uh, Friday, right? All right, uh, so the course mailing list, obviously. Uh, you notice that there are already announcements there. And these announcements are automatically sent to your UNSA assigned email address, which is why it's important that you figure out how to use it, right? Also, if you are new in class, uh, what I've, we've been doing, like I said last time, you see me with a few gadgets here, I've been experimenting with uh, creating lecture screencasts, and so there's, there's a link in the, in the course syllabus, a document I gave out in the first and second day of class. Uh, that has, a, uh, I think, a URL to a playlist, a YouTube playlist this is what you see. So every lecture, a la this one, will be recorded and archived there, right? So you can watch it if you want to. Essentially, you'll be watching the slides move, right? So like, you don't have to complain, you can see it afterwards, right? All right, uh, so without further ado, uh, today's lecture series uh, is as follows. It's going to be outlined as follows. We'll start with an introduction, look at some classification aspects that we're going to focus on as we're discussing these five, one, two, three, four, five different categories or types, functional types of computer systems, right? Again, uh, just to mention that depending on the type of resource that you find yourself reading, uh, it's entirely possible that some of these things might not be included because they're obsolete, like mini computers are not as uh, frequently used as they were back in the day, like in the 80s, for instance. Um, Mainframes are also obsolete, right? I'm told UNSA used to have uh, massive mainframes, right? I, 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 and, and so a few weeks ago, we, we went somewhere and we had this meeting and people were uh, obsessed with, they wanted to come and visit UNSA so that they could come and see the mainframes. They were asking if they're still there. Apparently they're still there. It would be nice if we went there as a group one of these fine days as part of the lab to just go and see the mainframe, how it looks like, right? Although, you can literally go online and just search for mainframe and then like a whole bunch of images will come up. If you go on YouTube and search mainframe computers, um, you should be able to see some pretty nice examples. All right, and then we'll summarize. Pretty short class today. All right, just to try and rub it in again, our definition of the computer system, remember those four aspects, right? Uh, it's an electronic device um, that accepts input, processes the input data, right? Um, and then optionally stores it and uh, also produces some sort of output, right? Uh, and we had an appreciation last week when we looked at a whole range of uh, examples, right? Uh, and in fact, we had a somewhat nice discussion about some uh, unconventional outputs that we'd expect. It's, it's not necessarily the case that your output be presented to screen or to your headphones when you're playing music or watching a movie, for instance, but um, output is best perceived in terms of, what, don't know. It's best perceived in, in terms of what the overall objective is of that computer system. A, a classic example we gave last time was 
this thing we are calling a drone. Now I, I, I can't hold it in anymore. We shall pass this round when we start discussing, uh, when we start discussing, um, we shall pass this round, I guess we can start passing this round when we start discussing embedded systems, right? Um, so we say this thing, right? It produces some sort of output, but well, if you're getting video footage, obviously you can pass this around. If you're getting video footage, for instance, maybe you could argue to say the video you're watching, the area view of whatever footage the drone is taking is output, right? But there are other things that are happening, right? So output is not necessarily just visual, all right? All right, and, and this thing we mentioned is it's gonna be crucial in us understanding what we're doing, right? Again, last time I said, we are playing around with an onion here. We are trying to understand the computer system and the best approach for us we found, or we're speculating here, is top-down approach, right? Start with the high-level components. Now, so, um, just to mention that, uh, welcome, sir. Just to mention, now maybe we should have some other ground rules about late coming here, right? It shouldn't be. <coughs> Disrupts the flow, people. Uh. Right, so in terms of the aspects that we're gonna look at as we're discussing these things in succession, please feel free to ask questions, right? Don't steal the props or anything else there. Uh, we will look at things like size. So some of the aspects we're gonna be looking at are aligned with what we discussed last, in the previous lecture, right, last week. We're looking at things like relative cost, uh, things like uh, the size, right, performance, right, in terms of efficiency. Um, we touched on things to do with reliability, I suppose. Maybe to a certain extent, effectiveness, right? Um, even though we, we focused on efficiency, uh, I want us to, as we're discussing these things, I want us to think more generally in terms of performance, right? So we look at, because I mean, some performance metrics here would be efficiency, things like throughput, uh, and also I think performance can be perceived in terms of how much power the device is consuming, right? the computer system is consuming, right? So we discuss this um, in succession, and what I thought would be interesting is if we, if we actually start our discussion, if we dis discuss these five different categories um, in order of increasing size, starting with embedded systems, right? So what we are saying is, generally speaking, these things that we are calling embedded computer systems uh, um, have certain peculiar characteristics such as their size, so they're relatively small in size. Uh, and they're called embedded computer systems because the computer system itself is is actually a part of a much larger device, right? So, so it's not it's not really a core part of that device. Uh, a classic example is uh, the customer interface unit from Zesco, right? There's a there's an embedded computer system in here, but fundamentally, the core function of this device has little to, excuse me, to do with. Um, well, it has, I guess, but not to a large extent. The focus is not really on the computer system itself, right? Uh, this is interesting stuff here. Right. Uh, so usually your, 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 your core computer system component, which is a processor, is built into the device itself, so you won't be able to see it, um, unless if you rip it apart or something. And, and something else that is, is kind of unique to embedded systems is, and this is a terrible example here, is, Usually there is no direct user interface, right? So you cannot, you, you don't necessarily directly um, interact with the device. And the thing you are passing around here is a, is a good example, right? I, I cannot, for me to interact with that, that quadcopter, I must use either the, the app, right? Uh, the Android app, or uh, I need to use the joystick, right? So interaction with, there's, there's no interface, right? You need something to interact, not that it's important to pass this around. Another example I thought I would, I would pass here is a, an embedded system as well. This is a, I don't know if it's, that's a route or something. So when you, you, ha, when you subscribe to, um, to bro broadband internet connection, uh, for instance, one of the devices they'll probably give you is something of that sort, which you use to connect to the wider network, right? So um, that device is from Microlink, for instance, for me to connect, for us to connect at home, for us to connect to Microlink, we must go through that device. Now there's a computer system inside there. And for me to interact with that device actually, because it doesn't have, the only switch it has is a research, your research switch, right? But for, for us to interact with that thing, you need to remotely log into that 
that device. And when you remotely log in, you're actually interacting with the computer system that is embedded within that device, right? Right, so generally speaking, I mean, some, some of the giveaway, the telltale things is no direct user interface, right? Uh, this is kind of brings us to this, this discussion we had about space exploration last, last, is it last week and the week before, right? Notice that we were talking about, oh, new horizons and whatnot, it takes six hours for the signal to travel. In fact, the round trip is 12 hours. Um, you notice that there's, there's, no, there's no user interface, right? The only way that human beings interact with the onboard computer systems on that space probe is remotely, right? You're sending a signal. So there's, there's no need to have an interface, actually, right? Interesting stuff. But don't, do not be fooled or do not be deceived, right? It's not always the case that if a computer system does not have a user interface, then it's an embedded system. No. They actually uh, have a discussion about server computer systems, but there's, there's, uh, there's actually certain servers that you don't necessarily um, interact with using a user interface, you just remotely log in or something. Um, if, it, if, if it ever comes to a point where uh, you need to interact with it, maybe you need to go with like a, a keyboard or something in the mouse to interact with it. Right, so typically these things will perform, uh, the, I guess you would call them single function devices, right? If you look at this thing here, I can browse the internet, I can, Microcomputer. I can browse the internet, I can watch um, videos, um, I can listen to music, um, I can typeset using that, that, that thing here. There's a whole range of functionalities that can, um, can be performed using that single device, right? But in the case of embedded systems, yes, madam? Not always, but it's usually generally the case, we say. Mm. Right. And we know why. It's a single function device. Why would you need an interface for a single function device, right? Uh, I should have taken a photo of, uh, you know how these days people have become obsessed with automated gates, right? You have a remote and, yeah? Uh, if you pay particular attention to, usually it's, uh, so if the, the gate opens from right to left, for instance, if you pay particular attention, usually there's a, there's, there's a, a device that's built right at the left corner, right? That's an embedded computer system, right? And the way that you interact with it is through that remote, right? You press the remote, it opens. You press it, it closes, right? Single function device. Doesn't do anything else other than that. Or maybe it beeps also, right, if there's something wrong there. But, so generally, it's dedicated uh, activities or tasks are performed by this embedded system, like this drone. All it, all it does is just flown around, right? Um, usually, the, the component, the computing component that does the processing of um, that does that processes the input going into this device is generally a microcontroller embedded within the device, right? The microprocessor. So some typical examples is the router, so the, the whiz thing I'm passing around there, drones, right, uh, digital cameras. The, the application is kind of endless, actually. Uh, now, it's always nice to, the way this thing works is interesting. Sorry, it's dirty, but dust. The, that's a custom interface device. Now, I'm passing this around, the Zesco customer interface unit. I'm passing it around because it's an embedded computer system, but it has what? an interface, which is trying to answer your question implicitly here, right? Um, it, it works, the way it works is kind of interesting. It uses what they call, is it power line communication protocol something? So it only works, it uses the, the, the Zesco power line as a communication medium, right? So when you're sending the signal, if I unplug it, it won't work, right? It only works when I plug it into the power supply. A friend of mine was, came to see me the other day, right? It's like a, how, does this thing use Wi-Fi? I'm like, no, it doesn't use Wi-Fi. And he couldn't believe me, right? So uh, um, I removed it from the, um, from the socket, the power socket, to show him that it actually does not use Wi-Fi, right? Anyway. <clears throat> right, so some, some of the key, obvious advantages of these computer systems is uh, they're insanely cheap, right? Quite affordable. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, people, people in the 
do it yourself community have been obsessing a lot with uh, microcontrollers such as Raspberry Pis and Arduino boards and whatnot. Um, and people can do that because these are really cheap, right? I remember buying a, the Raspberry Pi is like credit card sized computer, at least a Model B. Um, and I remember buying it at what? Was that, must have been like, uh, I don't know, for $20 or something, right? Which is quite nice. All right, so they are portable, obviously, right? Which is why um, they are mostly embedded into like a much bigger device, for instance, right? Because of their size. Generally efficient, one of the reasons why they're efficient is because there's nothing they perform other than this single dedicated task or activity, right? Um, so minimal power consumption. There's a SQL customer interface unit I'm passing around there. Can literally operate uh, using, is it one, one AA battery or something, right? Which is kind of nice, I guess. Mm. I just feel strong with the dog. All right, so some obviously you talk about advantages. You must also talk about some some drawbacks of these devices, right? You have very little control over the device. This is a big one here, and, and you gain an appreciation of this once we start looking at uh, uh, MIPS assembly language programming next term, and more importantly, when you start learning how to to program using high level programming languages next year, right? In second year, um, you can't do much with this device, right? Because it's a single function device. You cannot modify the code. In cases where you can modify the code, it's insanely difficult for you to modify the code, right? Uh, they perform specialized devices, single function devices. I always tell people, I don't put on a watch because I don't see the point. It's a single function device. Why do I have to put extra weight on my body, right? So these things, uh, you're investing money in this in this uh, embedded computer system, that's only going to do one thing, right? If you have a lot of money, yes, but you're, if you're cash strapped, you want to buy a device like this that's going to be multi-purpose, right? Run slides, connect to a projector, type, watch videos, uh, play video games, yeah? Mm. A what? No, well, it's... This is a thing here. Maybe a digital wash, not an analog. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but which is why I was making a distinction between analog and digital devices, right? This is what we are focusing on, actually. You could argue, I mean, hey, the analytic engine was tagged as a computer, right? The, uh, the Pascal, the things that we were discussing, with, and the devices that came circa, well, I guess before 1935. Remember the discussion we had on historical milestones? We are restricting our definition, again, just to wrap it in, we're restricting our definition of these computer systems to what? An electronic device, right? It's a digital computer, right? It's an electronic device that accepts inputs, processes input. And in fact, you notice once we look at the, the three functional components of the von Neumann architecture that an emphasis is actually placed on the central processing unit, right? So it must have a central processing unit. The wristwatch does not have a central processing unit. Maybe sophisticated ones, perhaps. Those Android phones, yeah? I've seen some of you with those things. Hi. Sorry, when you have? Um, an embedded system mm -hmm. in a device, right? And there's an interrupt that occurs in the system. Why does the effect first start? Does it affect well, the embedded system? It obviously affects the, because it affects the, the thing that's controlling the device, in which case it would be the microprocessor, the microcontroller, right? Um, so it affects the CPU, and then there's a cascading effect until eventually, hopefully, if the device is designed appropriately, you get a signal to show you to say an interrupt has occurred, something wrong has happened, right? Usually, like for this thing, it will be a, 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 the frequency at which the beep sound kind of comes out, right? Like if it's a beep, 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 then something wrong or something, I don't know, right? 
So it starts right down from the main, the core um, component, which is the microcontroller, the microprocessor. Then it comes up. Don't know what sort of interrupt you are referring to here. Don't know if that answers your question. Think more about that, and then uh, we can have a discussion about it. And I don't know. This is a, this is a bit. This is debatable, right? One would argue that. Uh, I guess due, due to their compact size, right? Due to the com compact size, uh, sometimes certain um, certain things have to be given up uh, by way of uh, reliability, I suppose. Which is why this point is there. But I mean, it's a it's a contentious issue here. I guess it, it's dependent on what sort of device this computer system is embedded in. Like for instance, if we're talking about space probes, right? One would argue that the, the onboard computer systems are actually quite reliable, right? So, but if we're doing a comparison between uh, a rasp Raspberry Pi or a, an Arduino board and a micro um, microcomputer, a PC, um, then obviously yeah, we, we, we could just as well easily say uh, that this thing here, embedded system, is not as reliable when compared to a microcomputer, right? Um, this, I suppose, one would argue is reliable. I mean, it's never given us problems, right? This device, even though you know, we've had it for almost two years now, and second hand. All right. So, um, the next in line here, right, embedded systems and the microcomputers or AKA PCs, the things they call personal computers, right? Um, so, what we are saying is uh, these are generally general purpose uh, computer systems, general purpose, uh, which is why they are widely used, right? How many of us have computers? How many of us have uh, computers, microcomputers? General purpose. You soon discover that almost all of us here do. Right? It turns out this is actually classified as microcomputer, right? It's a type of microcomputer. So if you have a smartphone, then you have a microcomputer. I was expecting more hands there. Right. Um, so you generally have more co control here. And, and again, we're making a comparison with embedded computer systems. You generally have this almost always a user interface, and there's a lot more control from the user, right? You might not have the control we're talking about, but the programmer, the person who's creating these programs. And you see that once we get to second year that the vast majority of programs that we'll be creating are actually directed towards what? Microcomputers, right? Desktop-based applications, uh, most of these um, web applications to a certain extent, although the server side, in the event that you're interacting with the web service, is generally hosted on a server computer system, and we'll discuss servers there. But for the most part, there's a lot more control and interactivity here, right? Uh, if, if I'm performing a very tedious task, like I was yesterday, I can create a very simple program because I have uh, control, right? Uh, we're working on an interesting project where we are compiling uh, scholarly publications at the UNSA, and so yesterday I was, I was harvesting uh, I was extracting data from the UNSA institutional repository, right? And instead of me manually doing that, I just created a very basic or a very simple script, right? I can do that because I have more control, right? Uh, it was somewhat interactive also. All right, so some typical characteristics here. I mean, these are perhaps the most widely used uh, types of computer systems. Although, right, with the coming of the <laughs> Internet of Things here, they're gradually being surpassed, right? But ahead of IoT, you know how they say, now we can hook up refrigerators to the internet, and uh, in fact, even our dogs, right? Not, not explicitly, but you know, you can put uh, chips, right? You can microchip them, and then just, that microchip obviously is like hooked up to some network, and you know, so all those are like examples of embedded systems now, uh, because there are more and more um, scenarios where embedded systems are becoming useful, uh, we're increasingly having a lot more of those things, right? Right, so perhaps the most widely used types of computers now, 
Like, this is an educated guess. It would probably be embedded systems, right? They're everywhere, right? You find someone running around and they have something strapped around them, right? It's like dumping data to their, their I don't know, accounts, Strava account, I use Strava a lot, Strava account or something, right? You, 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 you what? You, now this is, you are, I don't know how this is. Ah, right? I, uh, I pass it around, I'm not keeping trouble. So you are moving around like a cycle. Oh, a cycle, I don't know what happened there. I cycle religiously, right? And when I'm cycling most of the time, I don't know what happened there. Is it me or you? Sorry about that. When I'm cycling, sometimes I will, um, I'll get live video feed and I use the GoPro there. Uh, I can easily connect it to the internet, it actually has, uh, but I don't, obviously, I think I could actually, but I don't, but embedded computer system, right? <sighs> Is this making sense, ladies and gentlemen? Now, you know, I, as, as we're having these discussions, right, I, it's, it's always nice that we, we kind of uh, not just uh, sit in and say, oh, embedded systems and whatnot. We, we must think of, we must start thinking of um, things we could do to our environment, right, to try and make life um, easier for us, right? I have never, I mean, I've been at the Onza now for a little over a year, and I've never come across like a vending machine or something in here, right? So if I were you, I'd be thinking about that. Uh, uh, what would it take for us to set up some, some simple vending machine? Can we build one ourselves? I think we could, right? Just put it somewhere near the notice board there, right? These are, th no, I'm not saying, these are things we should be thinking about. We should be thinking outside the box, right? We're just thinking about the notes and the exam. We must think about how we can simplify life, right? Yeah? We, go to, we get on buses every time, right? What, could, what would we do to make uh, our lives a lot easier, right? Uh, I hate it when um, <laughs> you go to the station and you literally have to ask someone. I don't know if you still do that. You know what I mean? That's insane. We can, like, by the time we are leaving this place, we're in a position to automate most of those workflows, right? That's in part why we are in here learning, right? Huh? It's not just so we can, or well, maybe to get a job, I guess, but. But it's so we can make life a lot easier, which is why I forced you guys to go and read Vision 2030, right? Working towards an information and knowledge-based society, right, by 2030. Are we there yet? Don't know. All right, so some, what we're saying is that, um, right, uh, so general purpose computing tasks where to be used, uh, fairly easy to install and, and implement programs for this device, right? Um, in fact, these days it's become even easier. If you look up, uh, I encourage you to look up programming languages like Scratch. People in primary school can design programs, right? <laughs> Using Scratch for, for microcomputers, right? Uh, arguably not really sophisticated programs. But some examples here, your so-called desktop computers, right? Uh, laptops. Uh, handheld devices like smartphones. Now I have a question for you. Without an LCD screen, blah, 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 would we say this thing here we have here, would this be a full-fledged computer system? Without, you, you know how this tower based uh, microcomputer here, you need like a keyboard and a mouse. It's, you don't have an LCD screen integrated like I do here, right? So the question is, would we call this a computer system the way it is right Ah, thank you very much, yes indeed, right? Boom. All right, so some, some advantages here. Again, to a certain extent, they're portable, right? I always move my smartphone in my pocket. I can easily move in between lecture venues with my laptop now. It's a bit tedious, but you can easily move around with this thing as well, right? But general purpose as well, cost effective and affordable, right? The, these days, um, these days, the average student at Unza, I'll bet, has a microcomputer. Right? Perhaps not first years, but by second year, you'll be in a position 
um, where I think you find yourself in a position where you realize the importance of this device and you get one, right? You become cheap, right? Not cheap, but they're cost effective, they're affordable, right? And this is subjective, but they're affordable. Uh, I know some of you will come up with an argument, but there's no you know, allowance now, so they're not affordable. Yes, we know, right? <laughs> Sorry, it's a bad thing, but hopefully things will change. All right, so to a certain extent, and again, this is like uh, in comparison to some of the things we're gonna discuss, um, like mini computers and servers, mainframes and supercomputers, they generally have limited processing power, right? There are times when I can't, there are certain things that I cannot do here. Like I cannot play, computationally intensive games on this machine. In fact, there are times when this thing will freeze and I have to kill certain programs, I have to shut them down, right? Uh, even though I have four gigabytes of RAM, right? I don't know if it was 2.5 gigahertz processor speed or clock speed there, I don't know, it's somewhere there. But still, it has limited processing power, right? Uh, and I know some of you will probably come up with an argument, but you can easily buy more RAM, right? Yes, I know. But I'm just you know, giving it as an example. Things have changed, right? Things have changed. In fact, as you're talking more and more about um, these smartphones, these uh, contemporary smartphones, like this thing has six gigabytes of RAM, right? Uh, it has more RAM than my micro um, computer right there, right? That has four. Uh, GB of RAM, this has six GB of RAM, right? It's, how cool is that? But still, processing power is limited because increasingly as human beings, we find ourselves performing computing tasks that require a lot more resources, right? Which is why we need things like server computers, right? Uh, so typically, these are characterized as being uh, specialized, right? So they perform, similar to embedded systems, they perform specialized tasks that require more computational power, computational speed, right? Um, and because they, they require more computational power, they need more resources, they are generally more expensive, right? Which is why you typically have uh, large organizations being in a position to buy servers. Large organizations like the UNSA, for instance, right? We have a whole slew of servers. We'll look at some examples of functionalities exhibited by servers here, right? So. UNSA will typically have like dedicated servers performing certain unique functionalities. For instance, the UNSA website, www.unsa, www.unsa.zm, um, the server code that powers that website sits on a computer um, that is classified as a server computer system, right? Why does it need to sit on a server? Because we know that on average, there are generally a lot of hits to that site. A lot of people are simultaneously connecting to that site at any given point in time. Like right now, there's probably a thousand plus people connected. Don't know about a thousand, yeah, maybe a thousand plus, right? Hits going to the, to the, to the website, right? You cannot uh, manage to sustain all that load if you had the website installed on a machine like this with 4GB of RAM. No, right? Right, so typically they perform specialized computing tasks that are relatively large in size. It's just uh, an example here uh, of how a server will look like. Uh, there's generally what they call racks, server racks, and... Um, hmm? Yeah, well. Uh, right, so relatively large in size. Um, they require generally more computing resources. <laughs> you cannot power them using a battery, like this is not connected to mains power supply, right? But it's running. But you cannot do this with a server, right? It needs constant power supply. Um, it's done the new laboratory where we'll be working from, the Odell laboratory, um, has, uh, it employs a client server architecture where you have these dumb terminals uh, that are connecting to a server, right? So you don't necessarily have the machines that are there, there are about six or so machines, they don't have a dedicated uh, system unit. Right? Instead, you only have an LCD screen, right? Uh, a thin client, they call it, which connects to a server. So when you're in the lab, you're all connecting to the server, right? And you can do that because it can generally handle large, large loads, right? All right, so some, some typical functionalities associated with servers, and do not be deceived. When we're talking about servers, right? Um, our discussion of servers here is in reference to the actual computing 
system, right? But you find people talking about servers in terms of functionality, for instance, someone will talk about, oh, uh, the Unza web server, right? Right? They might be referring to, to the application that, that is installed so that the Unza website can run within it, for instance, right? But we're limiting our discussion to the actual physical computer system where, where those applications will actually be installed on, yeah? So some typical server functionalities here, you have storage servers or typically store files, right? I do believe Unza has this. I'm told that Unza has a, a backup, uh, an offsite backup facility, right? Which incidentally has to run uh, storage servers or server storage devices or computer systems, right? <laughs> the funny thing is, apparently it's located somewhere near the vet, right? <laughs> You don't do that. Uh, I'm laughing because you don't do that. Generally speaking, off-site um, um, storage facilities are located far away from where you work from. The reason you have that is so that you have some sort of geographic redundancy. Uh, sorry for this example, but it will help put the point across. Assuming some plane crashed near CI City where the servers are, or near Unza, and the crash site includes uh, the so-called offsite backup uh, facility, everything is gone, right? You need geographic redundancy. Uh, back in the day, when I, I, was, I, was, I was working for, for Airtel, the, the offsite storage facility was located somewhere near the airport, right? And, uh, back then, I think, uh, in fish places, I think when it was Celta was working somewhere near Long Acres and then we moved to uh, somewhere along Greatest Road here, somewhere near Manda Hill there. But you notice that there's, there's actually, I mean, you can, Unless if there was like an all-out all nuclear kind of uh, war and North Korea somehow bombed Zambia, sorry for the bad example, but at least you know that, that your data is safe, right? Because the off-site storage facility is located further out. But take our point here is a certain type of uh, server we're referring to here is a storage server, right? You have file servers, uh, Unza has file servers. Uh, very soon, uh, once you start the lab sessions, you'll be told to say, oh, for you to uh, access certain software tools, go to this, um, to, this, uh, to this link here. Generally, it's an FTP link, but one of the things an FTP server does is it, it stores files, right? right? So you need a file server for that. Right? FTP servers, um, web servers. Um, uh, the, the interesting thing about some of these things we're talking about is if, if you have a high spec server, you can literally have it exhibit all these different functionalities, right? So you can, you can have it work as a web server, as an FTP server, as a file, store, file server, and a storage server. Um, our department has uh, a server that we've been abusing. It's called list.unza.zm, list right? Um, and we have a whole bunch of things here. The DC hub, the list.unza.zm full call on 1209, it, it runs we run a, a, a DC server that you connect to when you're, when you're searching for, when you're downloading those files, right? It's sitting on the same, on the same server computer where we have the lease website running. So if you go to lease.unza.zm, for instance, it's incomplete, it's a mess. We have some second year students working on that, been messing it up. But the web server sits on the same physical server computer, right? Uh, We've activated FTP, so you can actually FTP into that thing and dump files and pull files from there, right? Right. The interesting thing, hey, by the way, is I have never physically seen the server itself. And so when we requested for this server, right, just told them we need a server and these are the specs we need, right? And then we just got a response from CICT. Uh, which happens to be a unit here that oversees a computing type of infrastructure to say this is how you get access to the server computer. And I don't care, right? As long as I can access it. Yes. Yes. Uh, there are abbreviations. File transfer protocol. File transfer protocol for FTP. Uh, the web server sometimes would probably be called an, I guess you would call it HTTP server. Hypertext transfer protocol. These are all protocols. This is how you, it's not coming in the, but you can look it up. I encourage you to look it up, look up the protocols. There's a dedicated course where you look at, 
I guess how to implement web applications and you discuss a whole range of protocols, right? There will be time for all of that. I've never seen the list of Unza.zm server. Hi. How cool is that? What type of system are traffic lights implemented? Well, that would be, so this is, here's an interesting question. It would be a, combi a combination of, uh, of perhaps embedded systems and server-based uh, computers, right? Because you see your traffic lights, there's, there's probably a control room where you have people connected to traffic. I'm, I'm guessing there are people, right? Right now in some control room, who are monitoring the traffic lights, trying to see if there's a problem and whatnot, yeah? So all that is, con I mean, so the lights themselves are probably controlled by a microcontroller, right? And we know this because in certain parts, uh, those embedded systems run using solar power, right? You've seen those things? I always think that's funny. But so those would be a combination of embedded systems and then you're yeah, hooking up because for people to be able to monitor what's happening, you need to connect those traffic lights to some control kind of infrastructure. And so obviously you have a whole range of computer systems being connected there. People that are interacting with the server are probably connected to microcomputers, right? But those microcomputers are, are accessing some sort of software which probably sits on some server, right? So we are all connected here. I'm trying to think of another example, no. So, more about servers here, like applications, right? Yes, I know, we are going to go slightly in because we started late, it was supposed to be 45, but hey. So here's the thing, Zamran, right, which, who are located is on the first floor right here. They, uh, remember I mentioned the issue of dedicated tasks? So they, they run a cluster of servers, and the reason they do that is there are researchers around Zambia that work on computationally intensive research problems, right? So these are, they, they, they might be computing some task that will take days or even weeks to run, right? You cannot run such a task on a machine like this because it will take even longer, right? Um, so, surprise, surprise, uh, entities like Xamarin will, will have like uh, clusters of servers. And in fact, it's not just Xamarin, there's this whole notion of cloud computing, I don't know if people have heard about it. The cloud, everybody's talking about the cloud, right? Because buying a server-based system is expensive, right? I didn't have, a, there's no cost here, it's supposed to be it's extremely expensive here. Because it's extremely expensive, an average person cannot afford to buy it. And in fact, in fact the return on investment is just, it's not worth it, right? You end up spending money for nothing, right? So it's better you rent, right? You're better off renting server space. So there's this whole notion of platform as a service, software as a service, yada, 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 they all connect. They're all aligned towards this whole thing they're calling cloud computing. And all you're doing when it comes to cloud computing is you're buying computing resources offered by some organization out there. Organizations like Google, Amazon, for instance, right? Microsoft, right? Um, so you, you, you contact Amazon to say you want, you want a dedicated server, you give them specs to say, I want it to have four cores and I want it to be maybe 2.5 gigahertz in clock speed. Um, and then they'll tell you to say, it will cost you X amount every month or X amount every minute or something. The, the, the pricing models they have are kind of different, right? But the bottom line is, all those things are possible because of server computer systems. All right, uh, we shall continue on, uh, Christ, on Friday morning. Where are we, sorry? No, no, on Wednesday we have a model training session, Paul. You're showing up uh, at the lab, at the thing, at the computer, computer lab, um, at the, 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 thing, the library basement computer laboratory. It's, it's there, near School of Humanities, not here. That's where Moodle is going to take place. You can't, uh, oh, if you have uh, more of my things. Uh. Hey, we should have like a few, t uh, nothing fun here, but should fly this or something. All right, are there any questions, by the way, as I'm connect, uh, doing things here? Are there any questions? No questions? All right, thank you very much. We shall see you when you see me. I'll probably be around, uh, don't know if I'll be around.